Take a moment and observe everything that's going on around you. The sounds, the smells, the sensations on your feet. Now, focus your attention back on this video. Those sensations didn't disappear as much as they were quieted by the brain in order to accomplish a specific task, in this case, focusing on this video. Focus, from a neuroscience perspective, is the brain's ability to selectively concentrate on one or more aspects of the environment while ignoring other aspects. To see how this works, I want to focus our attention to this specific region of the brain called the prefrontal cortex or PFC. Now the PFC in humans is the largest among mammals and is responsible for a wide range of cognitive functions, including morality, empathy, decision making, and importantly to our discussion today, managing distractions. But if we look at a very specific region of the PFC right here, this is called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or DLPFC. And yes, that is a mouthful, but this is the last area of the brain to fully mature. It takes until about age 25 for this to come fully online. And it's involved in a wide range of executive functions. Executive functions make it possible to mentally play with ideas. So this is like taking time to think before acting resisting temptations, um, meeting unanticipated challenges, and staying focused. The DLPFC, as far as we can tell, plays the largest role within the overall prefrontal cortex in managing relevant signals and suppressing the sensory noise, right? If you think about the sheer amount of information coming into the brain, you're gonna need to silence a good amount of that, and it looks like the DLPFC plays the largest role in that, but it's not an exclusive role. Like if we rotate this over, this right here is called the anterior cingulate cortex. It does a very similar job to the DLPFC as it, and in regards to managing distractions. It's just that it doesn't do it quite as effectively and in the same way. To put this as simply as possible, imagine yourself in a busy classroom. You're part of a group of students working to solve a problem but your task is to find a specific piece of information buried inside a textbook. Your ability to quiet the environment around you and the, all those distractions and focus your attention on the words directly in front of you is partly a product of your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex inhibiting those non-relevant signals. Now this is a quick aside, but I find it super interesting. The DLPFC has also been shown to be involved in ruminating for depressed individuals. So ruminating is where you're just like thinking about something over and over and over, just running through your mind. And so what this is showing us is that the DLPFC can be so good at quieting the external environment that it can also be, I guess, I don't know if that quite classifies as pathological. I think ruminating can be good in certain situations, but I think we all understand in a depressed state, ruminating is probably not the best thing to be doing, especially if it's just nonstop. But it just goes to show that, I mean, it's that good, right? It's just the entire world just starts to fade away and you're just focused on that one thing, just running it over and over in your mind. But another reason why the DLPFC's ability to quiet the external environment is so interesting to me is something that I alluded to earlier. And that was the brain, or specifically the DLPFC, doesn't fully mature until you're 25 years old. So you can't help but wonder, at least I can't, you know, what um, experiences in our youth or the role models that we're surrounding ourselves with, such as parents and teachers, how all of that impacts our ability to focus on those executive functions. This structure right here is called the brainstem, and it's actually made up of three other structures. Down here we have the medulla oblongata, then we have the pons in the middle, Pons actually means bridge, and that's because it's bridging the medulla to the midbrain. And running through the midbrain, pons, and medulla are 100 or so neural networks, and those are called the reticular activating system. And I want you to be very clear, the reticular activating system is not a specific structure, it's just bundles of neurons running through the brainstem. And the reason why we're interested in the reticular activating system is because it's responsible for a wide variety of functions. Cardiovascular control, pain modulation, but importantly to us, habituation. Habituation is the process where the brain ignores repetitive and non-useful information while remaining sensitive to other types of information. So if we were to compare and contrast this with the DLPFC, right? 
The DLPFC, you're kind of like consciously saying, I got to focus on this, right? I'm studying. There's a task I need to just ignore. I need to shut out the world. While the reticular activating system, on the other hand, is saying, oh, I've seen this stimulus a lot. I just don't need to focus on that. Instead, I'm going to focus on this stuff because it's far more relevant to me. A real easy example of this is the scent of your home. As you're constantly being bombarded with the smells of your couch, clothes, dogs, and everything else around you, there's no need to be processing those smells at any meaningful level of awareness. However, if a casserole is burning in the oven, probably a good idea to pick out that smell and then act on the problem. Habituation happens with all the senses. So sights, sounds, tastes, smells, touch, right? But what's interested me for years about habituation is the role it plays in stressful situations. Keeping calm under pressure is one of the most important things we can ever learn to do. Yet exposing yourself to high stakes situations can be detrimental to the body in numerous ways, depending on the circumstances. This is the reason you'll see professional athletes, pilots, astronauts, public speakers, military personnel, and more simulating stressful environments in an effort to habituate themselves in preparation for the real thing. When I was in the Marine Corps infantry, we used to do large and small mock exercises to try and simulate the battlefield without risking life and limb doing so. So we would do exercises like with like simulation rounds, firing those at one another. We do night exercises that had sound machines, uh, smoke grenades, um, flashing lights, like literally anything they could possibly do outside of actually creating a battle. They would do that to try and habituate us to what it's going to be like in the real deal. Now, obviously these simulated environments have limits regardless of the profession. No swimming pool will ever fully prepare an astronaut for the environment of space, but that doesn't make it a useless endeavor by any means. For the average person looking to improve their focus, Studies have shown exposing oneself to non-harmful yet distracting noises, smells, visuals, temperatures, and physical stimuli can help habituate in notable amounts in certain situations. A simple example of how this could potentially benefit someone is growing up in a busy household and then needing to study in a busy dorm room. In this instance, the ability of the reticular activating system to modulate the sensory information traveling to the cortex of the brain could be extremely beneficial. That's an oversimplification, but I think you get the idea. The main point I'm trying to make here is that the ability to silence external information and then focus on specific stimuli and accomplish a task, that's not a uniquely human trait, but the diverse ways that humans actually do it is endlessly fascinating. Thanks for watching everyone. I want to take a quick moment and give a huge thank you to all those that donate their bodies to science and education. Making videos like this just would not be possible without their incredible gift. And you know, there's just something truly powerful about being able to see these structures, how they really are. It just gives you information that you can't gain from a lecture, no matter how good that lecture is. So again, just wanted to say thank you to all those that donate their bodies. But I also wanted to say thank you for watching and I'll see you around.